Dear friends, my name is Tanvir Atsi and today we are going to talk about the inception or the beginning of modern art in India. The beginning of modern art as we all know is closely related rather it was possible because of the British in India. However, this argument can be contested very much but let's for some reasons which I will discuss further uh, while we'll come closer to discussing the artistic moments that shaped up in India, uh, we'll keep this portion of our lecture for that. If we see, when we are talking about modern art in India, we are obviously talking about the British India, that means India before 47, when it was not independent. Now, what was there in India before 1947? We will look at one aspect, that's the artistic aspect of it, but which means that the culture was not also devoid of what artists were doing in India. That is to say, that cultural practices and the social practices, socio-economic practices, social uh, political aspects were all responsible together to give rise to the idea of modern art in India. If we go back to the 19th century a little bit and see the advent of colonial empire in India and we'll be confronting the fact that with the European notions of art, colonialism extended to other countries including India with their cultural baggages. Now here, when the colonialism extended their rule, one thing becomes very important since we are talking about the visual arts so the notions also got transferred to india so the notions of beauty the notions of what art in quotes means the notions of what beauty in quotes means were radically or perhaps entirely different from what we had thought of what cultural ethos of indian or the cultural discourse or the aesthetic discourse or for that matter if we say artistic discourse and the aesthetic discourse which had laid down the foundations of the idea of beauty the idea of art so essentially as diverse as uh, a country as india when british came here they were not really happy with the cultural traditions of India with the artistic traditions of India. Now let me take you a little more back uh, with the collapse of Mughal Empire. Now what happened with the collapse of Mughal Empire? We see that the, the signs of collapse of the Mughal Empire were very much evident in the regime of Aurangzeb. Artists had started migrating from the cities, patronage was lacking and they had gone to places uh, like Guler, Kullu, Manali, which later gave rise to different schools and different narratives and different styles of art. Now, with the collapse of Mughal Empire, when British came to India, they disintegrated the Mughal Empire into fragments and reduced uh, the Indian society to feudalism. It's becoming... Now, what happens here to the art of India? How does a Britisher see what is happening in a miniature painting? And how does a Britisher see what is happening in Khajra? How does a Britisher see with what sense of artistic expression, with what sense of beauty did the sculptor at Sarnath carve a Buddha? These notions, of course, because Eurocentric notions, as we might have seen in the previous or in the following modules, that British notions or the Eurocentric, especially the European notions of art, were entirely different from that of India. What British were instrumental in doing they created binaries so there was tradition there was contemporary now these two terms are right now contested in the discourses but at that time the legacy of what we call traditional art is ironically given to us by britishers which we are harping on what happens to the tradition there so after 200 years of rule british were yet not able to understand in the early 20th century, what, it is, what are the aesthetic principles, what are the creative expressions that India, what, is the, what are the creative expressions that Indian artists in the past or at that time were expressing themselves with. They dubbed it as exotic, as something British were instrumental in carving out the notions of tradition. Now what they meant by tradition is very crucial. Tradition to them was something that was unchanged, that was unchangeable, that was 
static. The traditional art, which was the miniature art or the other folk artistic traditions that we practice in India, that were practiced in India, seemed to them a site of mere exoticism. They were least interested. After 200 years of the rule, colonial rule, when British were yet not able to understand what artistic practices, with what creative expertise, with what technical expertise, with what notions of art in mind, does an Indian artist create a work of art? Some of the Britishers who were art enthusiasts and had started looking back seriously at the traditional Indian art, so-called traditional Indian art, and they thought seriously about about the notion of Indianness. Something that was India's own, something that was made in India, something that was created in India, something that had ethos of India in it, something which could connect with the people, something that was not alienated from the people, something which people could respond to. And these were the beginnings of art. But there was a problem as well. When we see the beginnings of art with the establishments of art societies and art colleges in the beginning to promote the notions of modern art in India, it was also a project, you know, the so-called modernizing of the other, the, 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 the colonized, the oppressed British art history, or to say in broader terms, because British was not Responded, British was not exposed, the Empire of Britain was not exposed to the modern art itself. So the notions of art there were academic realism with fine details of human and by the artists. When the British art enthusiasts finally, after almost a cultural hiatus of 200 years in India, started to think modernizing Indian art, they were essentially concerned about how to bring the Eurocentric notions of what modern means to them. But one should remember here that the modern art which we see in the paintings of Picasso, Brock, Dali, Duchamp was not the art they were ready to propagate here because the British was yet itself to get exposed to that kind of video. Now what they started here was looking back at India's rich past and start giving a new mold to it by bringing together Western as well as Indian cultural ethos and artistic expressions. Now, we've come straight to the early 20th century and for some reasons I will not go to Bengal school because that has been a separate module and I'm sure that you have learned enough about it. We'll talk about the cities in India that were essentially colonial centers which proved instrumental in shaping up the idea of modern art in India. Again, to put a disclaimer, we're talking about British academic art, not the modern art in the sense of what modern art was in West. There were cities where Britishers, with the help of Indian artisans, what they used to call them, started thinking about a vocabulary that was feasible for both the Indian as well as the British audience. Now, these cities were the inception of modern art in India, as I said, could be traced to early 20th century, Modern art had started to remind you much before the independence of India and the cities that played crucial role in shaping up the idea of what Indian art was going to be in the future were Bombay, Lucknow, Calcutta, Madras, Lahore and later in Jaipur. What British did to spread the idea of their notions of modern art, of course taking into consideration what was happening in India and what had happened in the past, they established some artistic centers. So how did the Indian artisan, or to replace the word which has a colonial baggage on it, the Indian artist respond to this change? Let's go directly to some of the schools that were established and there are some of the societies that were instrumental and talk about the works of the artists, the groups that exhibited their work and also talk about the British art connoisseurs who played instrumental role in the movements in establishing these artistic societies, the art schools across five to six cities in India. This needs also to be mentioned here 
that most of these schools were headed by British. So the curriculum which was set up in the school was essentially based on the British notions of art. For example, if we look at the city of Bombay, we are not going to Kolkata again to remind you because Calcutta at that time was the epicenter of arts where three Tagores were active in bringing a new renaissance, cultural renaissance to the Indian art. It was Captain Glanstone Solomon, the director of then JJ School of Art from 1914 to 1936, who immensely contributed to the shaping up of the curriculum of JJ School of the Arts. As an, as an ardent admirer of Indian art, he proposed to establish a workshop called Indian Art Room within the premises of JJ School of Art. The aim was to show that the true work of the modern Indian artist is to revive the ancient and national methods of artistic expression and revitalize and restore. When his successor, Charles Gerard, became the director of Sir JJ School of the Art, he gave a new direction to the existent, to the existent curriculum in the school. When Charles Gerard became the director of JJ School of Art in 1936, he was instrumental in changing a lot, both in terms of the curriculum and bringing in new technical advances of European painting. Attempted to revive the traditional Indian artistic techniques, Gerard replaced them with the modern techniques of painting both in pastel and oils. He encouraged both students as well as teachers to work in modern mediums like oil, impasto and paint directly on the canvas with the help of a palette knife. The results of these attempts were soon to become evident. A group of artists who called themselves Young Turks were successful in fusing the Indian idioms, the Indian aesthetic values with that of the European notions of art and came up with marvelous artworks that they exhibited in a group show. These artists included P.T. Reddy, M.D. Bhopale, A.A. Majid, M.Y. Kulkarni and C.B. Baptista. Also, the group was also known as the Bombay Artists Group. They exhibited for the first time in 1941. Girard, who wrote the catalogue of their show wrote in his foreword that the young Indian contemporary artist is indeed a welcome individual in this age of strife and at a time when the influence of worldwide industrialization has left a degenerating effect upon artistic efforts of the craftsman, not excluding the painter craftsman. Such contemporary artists are pioneers in something worthwhile in life something that the world today needs badly that is a concerted effort that is a concentrated effort to establish a common desire for cultural outlook he further says we need many more of them if the desirable purpose of a universal and higher cultural outlook is to be achieved and we rely upon younger generation to show the way. Further to this, to achieve this, much experimental effort is called for and the young Indian artist is admirably fitted for the task. He further goes on, the exhibition represents the work of five young artists who have banded themselves together in a group to place before the public their individual expressions in painting, each approaching the subject from his own particular angle and vision. They are certainly a mixed group consisting Brahmins, non-Brahmins, a Muhammadan and an Indian Christian. Artists working harmoniously together as a simple unit, their singleness of purpose will eventually prove their strength in promoting a contemporary art movement which they have launched. They are the preoccupied in the, they are too preoccupied in their mission to enter into futile argument and idle controversy. They refer to get, they prefer to get on with the job. He further goes on to say that they do not mind criticism. They are sufficiently hardened to withstand the welter of public opinion, favorable or otherwise. Favorable opinion is always welcome. The unfavorable variety, however, should serve a stimulus, but no opinion expressed at all would be the most disheartening. He concludes with 
I have personally watched the development of these artists and have admired their untiring efforts to acquire the power to express themselves in paint, often under the most difficult financial circumstances they have continued to forge a hit stimulated by artistic urge within them. British introduced, as I said previously, new mediums of painting, new techniques of sculpting. They introduced watercolors, they introduced oil paints, they introduced the techniques of painting. During the early decades of Bombay, artists were considered proficient. You know, as we see the early decades of Bombay, we can find many experts who were considered proficient in making portraits, making landscapes, making general painting, making still lifes, making life studies, and so on and so forth. However, a few of them who still were not comfortable with the idea of European modernism followed the idea of revivalism, which was much in vogue as previously said in Bengal. These artists, they included Ravi Shankar Rawal, Rasiklal Pare, Kannu Desai, Adi Dhopeshwar, Y.K. Shukla, J.M. Solgaonkar, Bhanu Smart, Chaganlal Jadu, P.D. Bhagat, and Babuji Shilpi. Let's now turn our gaze towards Calcutta, the British Calcutta. Now let's turn our gaze towards Bengal. Let's look at how artistic scene was unfolding in 1940s of Bengal, the British Bengal, or especially in Calcutta. Now, as we all know about the inception of modern art in India with the rise of Abhinendranath Tagore in Calcutta. Now, what happened in Calcutta, that Calcutta was already an epicenter of intellectual and artistic activities in 1940s or before that as well. So what Calcutta or Bengal Renaissance was propagating was the idea of revivalism. Now how did this revivalism unfold? We all know we must have learned in the previous modules that they looked back with the help of E.B. Hewell, with the help of Kokozo Okakora, with the help of Sister Nivedita, with the help of Ananda Kumar Swami, they looked at the aesthetic principles and cultural idioms, artistic idioms of ancient India in which the artists of the past had expressed that they sought to bring them back. But at the same time in the 40s, Calcutta witnessed the end of nationalistic struggle and a devastating famine that killed over 2 million people. It is said that, and history books tell us, that the famine was well engineered by the British. This devastating effect of the famine created a considerable amount of impact on the minds of sensitive artists who started responding to the brutalities and devastation of the famine. These artists included Zainal Abedin, Adinath Mukherjee, and not to forget the painful representations of Chitra Prasad, the printmaker. On the other hand, the idea of revival of Indian art was not going in sync with the ideas of the younger generation of the Kolkata, that time Calcutta. So what they sought is they thought that revivalism is fraught with restrictions. It limits the artistic expression. They sought to challenge it and the challenge, first of all, came from the thinkers, the intellectual class. So thinkers like Akshay Kumar, Maitreya Sukumar Rai and Binay Kumar Sarkar raised concern about the European pictorial conventions and an opening up of the artistic tradition, an opening up of the heritage that is not restricted by a culture or for that matter by geography. But he was succeeded by none other than his nephew Jamini Prakash, who was not interested in revivalism of Indian art, who was more inclined to the Eurocentric notions of art and was in favor of, who was interested in blending of the European artistic principles with that of the regional ones, with that of the Indian ones, and he called for an international art. He changed the entire, he changed the curriculum of Calcutta College entirely by creating two categories, Indian art and fine art. A booklet later on, which tells us about the ideas that they were trying to float around about what their what they think actually the Indian art should be. Let's read a few excerpts from the catalogue that was written later on. 
In the concluding part of the booklet, it says the guiding motto of our group is best expressed in the slogan, art should be international and interdependent. In other words, our art cannot progress or develop if we always look back to our past glories and cling to our traditions at all costs. At all costs. The vast new world of art, rich and infinitely varied, created by masters of the world over, beckons us. We have to study all of them deeply, develop our appreciation of them and take from them all that we could profitably synthesize with our own requirements and tradition. This is all the more necessarily because this is all the more necessary because our art has stood still since the 18th century. During the past 200 years, the world outside India has made vast strides in art, has evolved epoch-making discoveries in forms and techniques. It's therefore absolutely necessary for us to close this hiatus by taking advantage of these developments in the Western world. What was cooking here? It was that the Calcutta group tried to dispense with the idea of revivalism. They tried to revitalize the art with the help of international, not only Eurocentric notions of art, but the ideas of uh, that were the ideas that were in very much vogue on the international landscape of art across the world. Their nostalgia with the cultural past was they were not interested in the nostalgia of the cultural past. The group the group held its first major exhibition in 1945. Eight artists participated in this exhibition who included Pradosh Das Gupta, Ratin Maitra, Nirod Majumdar, Parito Sen, Pran Krishnapal, Gopal Ghosh, and Shubho Tegor. Now here, all of them had individual styles, which is also an essential factor of modernism. They were not looking at a particular idiom, but rather all of them in their own different ways were attempting to create an individualistic expression, an individual language of art, an identity that was not necessarily nationalistic, but at the same time it was not devoid of the personal feelings, of the personal marks, of the, persona, of the artist's persona. It was reflective of all that. Now here, one should also remember that these decades were the most turbulent decades in terms of, as I said, the famine, also in terms of the looming war, also in terms of the uprisings that had shaped up the Quit India movement, and also these were the day, these were the years when India was about to gain independence. So there was an uproar across the country, and in the middle of this chaos, this group exhibited for the first time. In 1945. Now art history faces a certain problem because whatever has been said about them, whatever has been thought of them, whatever has been discoursed about them, whatever we read in the books is very little because a very little of archival documentation is available to us. Now all we could collect are the fragments from the newspapers, from the magazines who during that time recorded the 1945 exhibition especially, and also wrote in here and there about artists, about their personas, about their artwork. We don't know about their works. We are unaware to trace the actual works so that we could have, had they been there, we could have looked at how the artistic language of a particular artist evolved over a number of years. But unfortunately, we don't have access to that. Now, when they exhibited in Kolkata in 1945, the intellectual Mulkaraj Anand wrote about them. The exhibition of the Calcutta showed that the younger Bengalis were highly talented and that they were aware of Indian painting. But as they were all individual who had together in a group, their work fortunately, their work fortunately proceeded in unique directions without any subservience to the written words of a manifesto. And if they achieved only a few pictures and sculptures of great worth, 
they had shown tremendous courage in confronting the conservatives with a new direction for creative art. And reacting to their exhibitions in Bombay between 1944 and 1945, the critic of Times of India that time wrote, Bengal has exercised a very strong influence of modern Indian art ever since Abhinindranath Tagore, and his followers inspired the Indian Renaissance movement some 40 years ago. We welcome this exhibition of the Calcutta Group, which brings to Bombay the first specimen of modern Bengal art scene. They discussed together, the group lasted for 10 years. As we all know, with the establishment of Madras Presidency in 1652, the cultural capital of Tanjavur was replaced with Madras, the current Chennai. Had been successful in creating a strong toehold in the South India, much in the later decades of 19th century. As we see, the artists like Aligri Swami, Ram Swami Naikar, and later in famous Raja Ravi Verma were the first proponents of British academic realism. Later on, with the establishment of College of Art in Madras, the principal, the then vice principal, D.P. Rai Chaudhary, evolved a very strong but new idiom of academic realism. It was also the time when E.B. Hevel, an Englishman who was also an art critic and a wonderful enthusiast of Indian art, had floated the idea of Indianness. As we have already discussed about the idea of revival, E.B. Hevel was one of the major proponents of revivalism in India. This was also the time between 1890. Uh, 1884 and 1892, when an English gentleman called E. B. Hevel had floated the idea of Indianness. Now, what this Indianness was all about, as you must have learned in the in the previous modules, about the revival, about looking back at the rich cultural and artistic heritage of India and bringing the elements of it, bringing the aesthetic values of it in the modern art of India. Although he found very few takers in and around South India, his idea was fully taken on by the artists of Calcutta, prominent of them was the Abhinindranath Tagore. D.P. Rai Chaudhary, who also happened to be a student of Abhinindranath Tagore, initiated a blend of Indian and Western style, as I said, evolving a completely new idiom, which he worked in for his life. Let's, let's turn our eyes towards Lahore and see what was happening in Lahore during early 20th century. Now, it's a very crucial thing that Lahore was considered to be the epicenter of intellectual activities. It was an important educational center. It was an important center for literary arts. But ironically, it happens that until the arrival of B.C. Sanyal in 1920, until the arrival of B.C. Sanyal in 1929, the city of Lahore, which was educationally and literally so charged a space, looks somewhat a desolate city. The B.C. Sanyal here was uh, commissioned a work to establish until the arrival of B.C. Sanyal who was commissioned to erect the statue of Lala Lajpat Rai at the All India Congress Committee session in 1929. The city of Lahore on the cultural map of India appears to be somewhat a culturally desolate city. B.C. Sanyal found the city conge congenial for the artistic activity. In this conducive atmosphere, he established his studio where he began his artistic activity with a few other members of the city who were active in promoting art. The studio soon became the epicenter for the art in Lahore and many artists and a flock of young artists who later became big names of the Indian art started training under the tutelage of B.C. Sanyal. One of the core members who came in contact with B.C. Sanyal in Lahore was Pranath Moku. He recounts his experience as follows. Some of us then did sincerely strive to understand and find a way out of the creative malaise that has stricken not only artists of Lahore but also artists in other parts of the country. Artists, although they had a living connection with the past, were from the early 18th century victims of a major social-political upheaval that touched every aspect of their lives, including creative activity. The Maya School of Art in Lahore, established by the British, focused mostly on the cast. Uh, B.C. Sanyal and uh, his colleagues 
the young artist felt that this is restricting the creative expression and went on their own way. Key role, Lahora Fortis played a key role in shaping up the artistic as well as the cultural landscape of India. The College of Art in Lucknow was established in 1911. The idea of the college, again, was going back to the idea of blending together the Indian and the Western notions of art and coming up with an idiom that could communicate, that would reflect the ethos of Lucknow as a city, as an epicenter of culture. Various pioneers of Indian art who were instrumental in forging a dialogue, who were instrumental in creating a scenario of Indian art at Lucknow. J.M. J. M. Ahivasi, B. Sain, Sri Ram Vaish, Sudhir Khastagir, Sridhar Mahapatra, H. L. Murch, Bishwanath Mukherjee, and R. R. S. Bish. As we saw coming to the concluding part of this session, as we saw in what was happening in Madras, what was happening in Kolkata, what was happening in Mumbai, that time Bombay, what was happening in Lucknow, what was happening in Lahore. Now these artistic movements, these artistic endeavors, which were not essentially movements in the strictest sense of the word, as we discussed early, that Kolkata artists didn't have an ideologue, but what connected them together was the idea of bringing the our Indian art to an international platform. The same ideas that connected these early developments together was creating a new identity of India on the world cultural map, giving rise to an Indian art which could speak for itself, ideating about what the international art as we all in the early part of the 20th century in India suffered a huge identity crisis. Artists, intellectuals and other class of the society were exceptionally concerned about India's own identity as a country, as a nation on the world cultural map. And this identity crisis, these ideas about how to define, how to represent India on the world cultural map gave rise to the artistic movements that shaped up in various cities.